that's when he really started to come more into his own and started to act independently and started to represent himself because previously he was always the line of the down the line of Muhammad teaches us thus and so. But then he started to, to come up with his own plan and his own um, you know, strategy for for um, you know human rights um, and creating the Muslim Mosque Incorporated and the OAAU, Organization of African American Unity, founded after the OA, OAU in Africa. So, does that answer your question? All right. Well, that's the question. Answer. So right. I guess the audience. Now we can open it up to the audience. Sir, Will. Oh, thank you. Man, he's about to fall asleep. I, didn't get, I mean, he, I think he was talking more to me than he was to Greg. So that's why I wanted to try to interject to get a response, and yeah. I wanted to kind of defend myself a little bit. But the, the first thing is that uh, I've been involved in both both sides of the issue. I've been with the NAACP core, Urban League, and I also been with revolutionary organizations such as Black Panther Party. Black Panther Party and the Uhuru movement. And one thing that we've, we've done, that we've had a struggle with uh, for, a, for the last t 20 years, is the, this whole question of Martin Luther King being called an Uncle Tom. And we have grown to respect Martin Luther King after we did further research. So when, when you're saying that the black, the, the, even the Pan Africanist Congress of Azania, which is South Africa, that's the real name for South Africa, Azania. The Pan Africanist Congress of Azania and other revolutionary group groups that we've aligned ourselves with, both in Africa and in the United States and the Caribbean, Caribbean, South America, etc. Your your analysis of of the revolutionary movement of discrediting the significance of Martin Luther King is severely error. Okay, because we do have great respect for Martin Luther King, especially when we started to do further research and found out his stance against the war in Vietnam is what really catapulted the uh, COINTELPRO to, to uh, get rid of the idea of supporting Ma uh, uh, Martin Luther King because they said as soon as he uh, vacates the rhetoric of nonviolence, then we're going to have to get rid of it. But as long as he's espousing that rhetoric of nonviolence, we're, we're supporting it because he's our man. He in that box, like Brett was saying, he was funded not, not only by the, the whites, what you want to call it, but the whites get a bad hand because it was a Jewish organization that supported King more than anybody. And the ADL is one of the primary organizations that was instrumental in his death because they are the ones that supplied both the FBI and the CIA with the information that they used on King, his flirtatious acts with women and such like that, to use it to discredit him. But the point is that I want to make sure you're clear. The Black Revolutionary Organization, which I was a part of, okay, which you've never been part of any Black Revolutionary Organization in your life, okay, but the Black Revolutionaries do have great respect for Martin Luther King, especially when he made his courageous stance against the, against the Vietnam War, okay, he, they do have great respect for him, and I'm talking about revolutionary organizations from around the world, and the pan Africanist Congress of Azania, one of the most powerful Black Revolutionary Organizations that, that exists in Africa, does support Martin Luther King, okay. Then you, you, you made a, quite a few statements, but the point is, even in this, this whole discussion, Martin Luther King and Malcolm, at, at various times in life, just like you and me and everybody else in this room, we've made erroneous statements. When you said he wanted to retaliate and kill white, the white, in, white children since the, the, the uh, church was bombed and they killed black, little black boys and girls. People do, I've made statements as well, but as I grow, I say, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't have made that statement. But, but I'm growing and I'm understanding Martin Luther King grew just like everybody else. And he did not, at the beginning, speak out against the Vietnam War. But as he started to develop and even started to look at what Malcolm X and other revolutionary organizations were saying, he said, wait a minute, there's not much of a difference between the two of us. Yes, we may have uh, uh, some strategical differences. But ultimately, he said that the problem is, it isn't us being nonviolent here because there's nothing nonviolent about America. There's nothing nonviolent about America. So, it, so what he's doing, he's calling on America to be nonviolent in Vietnam, just like learn from the black people here that were being nonviolent. Then if we nonviolent here, then why don't, the, why don't America become nonviolent in Vietnam, one of the most atrocious wars in history? Okay, so I think that what we ought to do, though, is start to see the similarities between Malcolm and Martin, because at the end of their lives, there was more similarity than these glaring differences that you're, that you're espousing right now. You, you, you focus it on their previous 
uh, life when in reality, what we should be focused on, what happened on the outcome? Because if I look at your life 10, 15 years ago, or my life 10 or 15 years ago, you say, oh, that's a raving mad idiot. But if you look at the person today, what are they doing? Because Malcolm and Martin did a whole, they, they, they were in total, well, not total agreement, but they agree, agree much more than what you're saying. You're, you, you're, going, you, you're attacking, I mean, you're, you're, you're showing the differences. Those were differences at one time, but not at the end of their lives. The differences were, were, were minimal at the end of their lives, but you're acting like at the well, end well, of their lives, they, well, they were pitting, going against each other's throats about this nonviolent and violent rhetoric. Now, the nonviolent and violent, violent rhetoric, you need to understand self-defense. Okay, in the early 1990s, I was part of a group called the African Community Defense Committee, which we learned from SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, under Stokely Carmichael, in which Stokely Carmichael learned the power, the phrase from Willie Mukasa Richard, who's a good friend of mine, the black power phrase. Okay, but the black power phrase and the self-defense mechanism is what you need to be more concerned with. Violence is not what Malcolm X advocated. He may have made some erroneous statements at one time, but violence would mean, what the whole ideal violence was self-defense, but the media in America redefined it as violence because they wanted us to be what they wanted us to be was self nonviolent. They wanted us to do what Martin Luther King did. And most people said, wait a minute, we need to question this whole ideology of, of nonviolence. And who is, who is really the perpetrator of this ideology? Is it really Martin Luther King who was selected to be a spokesperson for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference movement. He wasn't just somebody said, I want to do this. He was selected because of his great oratorical skills. And he, I mean, he was a good person, I'm not saying that, but he, he, he was selected to do that. In 1954, I believe when this SCLC was, was started. But the point is that there is a flip side of history that we all should look at and not ridicule because the flip side of history will balance out some of these discussions that we have. This discussion that you guys are having, it's more so Clausel, you're attacking Malcolm way too much because they had more similarities than differences, especially at the end of their lives. We all are gonna have differences. We've all done things in our past that some of us don't, don't agree with. I've done things in my past that I don't agree with, but I know for sure that what Malcolm and Martin was doing, we should learn from that and say, okay, yeah, they did do these things then, but at the end of their lives, they were. More, there are more things in common than not. Yeah, I was, um, from some of the information I've seen, uh, Malcolm X, towards the time that he was dying, he was disaligning himself from some of the traditional beliefs of where he came from, and Martin Luther King was dissing himself, not necessarily dissing himself from people, but some of the beliefs that he held before he died. Um, he even made some quotes. I even put one on my uh, Facebook page where he said, the evils of capitalism are much greater than the evils of racism. He said that a couple of months before he died. And that was around the Vietnam War because part of the Vietnam War, obviously, when the United States goes to other countries, is there's an economic, there's an economic purpose of war. And um, a lot of times we don't get to really, we don't really get to see too much about those beliefs that those two had changing because they were dead after they had those beliefs. They didn't live too much longer after them. After they got off of those two strong points, those two strong man points that you and him were fighting against, they didn't live too much longer. And there was a reason for that. Right. So you're, 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 you're focusing on what you're focusing on what they were at their most extreme points. But they came off of those extreme points before they died. And that was probably some of the reasons why they died. Because they started to see some of the, some of the similarities between each other. And they started to see that it wasn't always what they thought it was. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. like, hold on. I, I, first of all, I want to say, I, I wasn't badgering uh, Malcolm X. Like, I think what I said was, um, in, in one of my statements, I was like, I look, I like Malcolm X. I've seen all his YouTube videos. Like I, like I said, I look up to Malcolm X. I adopt his principles right now in terms of self-defense. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying, what my argument was, was that his, my, I think Martin Luther King's strategy was the most effective strategy at the time. And like you mentioned something about the pan -African